All right, so uh, now it's time to dive into the panels and we are going to start with our first panel of the day, five-star employer, best practices, veteran employee, retention and promotion. Uh, panelists, please make your way to the stage now. Uh, as you do so, uh, I'm gonna give everyone kind of a little introduction, uh, what to expect from this panel. Uh, again, as I mentioned previously, uh, this is a special panel uh, that features organizations honored as Vets Index's five-star employers. Again, our highest award level, which is, you know, really an accomplishment, something uh, very challenging to achieve. So congratulations to all of them. Uh, and our thinking is, uh, who better to lead off this conference than uh, these uh, very highly awarded organizations who can talk about uh, what propelled them to uh, the top tier. Um, now, today's panel is going to focus uh, on something that I think is a little too often overlooked in the veteran employment space, uh, and that is not just recruiting, but retention and development and promotion of uh, veteran and military connected employees. Uh, a lot of the focus in uh, veteran employment is recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. How do we bring them in? How do we bring them in? Uh, it's great to hire veterans, military spouses, members of the Guard and Reserve, but if you're hiring them and then they are out the revolving door six months later, it doesn't do you any good as an organization and it doesn't do the veterans any good either. Um, so how do you keep them? And once you keep your uh, military connected employees, how do you promote them, develop them into senior leaders in your organization? Uh, well, these are the questions that uh, my panel here is, uh, uh, is going to discuss. Um, so let me introduce our great slate of panelists. Uh, we have George Burnlor from Booz Allen Hamilton. Maroon, please give him a hand. <laughs> Edward Carr from Comcast NBC Universal. <laughs> Phil McConkey from Academy Securities. and John Perez from Johnson & Johnson. All right, so I have a bunch of questions for you all, uh, but I typically like to uh, get these things started by uh, letting you all direct the conversation. So I'm just gonna throw out a, a big softball and uh, ask each of you to uh, swing away. Uh, just talk to me about uh, a big picture overview of how your organization uh, approaches uh, retention and development. Let me get started. Okay, yeah, so I guess I'll get started first. So um, good morning, everyone. First of all, let me just start off with, it is awesome being back in person again. God, this is like fantastic, I love it. Um, and thank you for having this in New York City. I'm a big Yankees fan, so I took advantage of going to the game last night. Unfortunately, it was a loss, but hey, it was great being back in the stadium. And, uh, and seeing it. Um, so great question. Um, how does Comcast, NBC Universal, how do we approach retention um, and, and development of our, of our military community? Um, well, one of the things that we do, uh, our team with the, the Military Veteran Affairs team, uh, every year we have a, we call it MILDEV. So it's Military Professional Development um, two-day symposium. And what we do is we bring in about it's roughly 100 of our teammates from across the entire enterprise. We bring them all into one location. Uh, historically, it's been Philadelphia. Um, we've done it around the Army-Navy game. Um, we're getting it away from that, I will say, <laughs> this year. This year, we'll do it in Atlanta. Um, but we usually do it around uh, an event. We bring everybody in to one location um, from the entire enterprise. So we're bringing in our teammates from Comcast. We're bringing them in from NBCU. We're bringing them in from Telemundo, from Golf, from Parks, the entire organization. And we do a, we do a two day professional development seminar um, or symposium where we're focused on you know things that they can do to we bring in speakers to talk about you know how they can build their own personal brand how they can build you know build themselves professionally and then we follow it up with uh, check ins throughout the year uh, quarterly check ins so it's basically a one year cohort based uh, people that come to it and we do follow up meetings with them and we help them. Um, throughout the year, uh, like, so for example, this year, well, what they do is every quarter they're checking in and they're, they're built. So the first one was to work on how do you build your network? The second one is how do you build your brand to your, or how do you promote your personal brand to your network? And it's gonna build up the last um, uh, cohort meeting this year will be how do you take all the tools that you've learned this year 
and discuss it with your supervisor um, around the performance evaluation time. So MillDev has grown. Um, I will tell you, it's highly sought after. Um, we probably have about four to 500 people apply every year to come to MillDev for, for the two days. Um, and so through that, we've had to create a, a you know, selection process and all that stuff. But it, it's one of our signature events. Um, people are, I'd like to say people are joining the military so they could actually be part of MillDev. Um, you know, they're not. They're not. But, you know, that's the old Army recruiter in me coming out. Um, but, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's a great event, and I, I think it's helping. You know, we have, we have seen pre-pandemic, uh, we've seen some, some, some metrics that came back and said, you know, the people that have attended MillDev were getting promoted at a, at a faster rate. Um, you know, they were, they were being retained at a higher rate. Um, so, you know, that was obviously we're all pre-pandemic numbers. We haven't done that since. So it's going to be interesting to see what that's looking like on the, on the back end. But that, that's one of the things we do. Please go ahead, George. All righty. So um, as George asked the question, and I had all these scenes going off in my head, there's a, it feels like there's many, many uh, things that we do uh, around Booz Allen Hamilton to promote retention and development, not just of our veterans, but all of our employees. So I would imagine like uh, most companies out there, it all starts with a solid orientation program that all uh, employees go through. One of the things that uh, I really like about our structure, though, is when an individual comes on board, they typically have two folks that they report to, a job manager and a career manager. So the job manager, as you might imagine, handles your day-to-day -day activities, the work that you're going to do. But your career manager is this individual that is in place to nurture your career, help, uh, help, get off, help, help you get off to a good start. So they're more of a mentor. Uh, but they'll assign you know, training, uh, recommend training, things that you can do. And it's an ongoing process that lasts uh, a year. And all employees really get to benefit from that. But our veterans, we, we have a couple of other uh, initiatives and programs that help, especially with the development piece and uh, the mentoring and, and growth of those individuals. One of the things that we kicked off not too long ago, and this was done by a handful of volunteers through our military and veteran business resource group, they developed what we call a transition center of excellence, and it's mostly aimed at our newly separated veterans. First job out of the military, going through that acclimation process. Maybe there's a little hesitation to go to that career manager, you know, for some questions, advice, et cetera. So we set up a, a sponsor type program that takes the uh, new hires through a little bit of a slower walk through the orientation process, make sure they get, you know, a lot of the, all that information is kind of pushed your way that first week. Uh, break it up over a set of a, a few weeks to make sure everybody understands the tools, the resources, what's out there to help you acclimate and, and grow that career. Then it, it moves into a natural mentorship type program where you can select individuals from our uh, business resource group and get into a mentoring program. So you, you don't just have that career manager, but you can have individuals that are veterans or champions of our uh, veterans that participate and help you really, again, acclimate over that, that first year uh, with, the, with the company. It's designed to, you know, as, as, as many of you know, um, you know, the track record of newly separated veterans and that first job that they get out of the military, uh, I think the number somewhere in the ballpark of 50% or more will leave that opportunity in their first year. So this is one of the efforts to reverse that uh, trend. And it's been very successful in really helping an individual acclimate and grow with the company. There are a couple other things that we do along the lines of recognizing our veterans as well. And it's amazing sometimes just the little things that you do that uh, could be like a small token of appreciation, a word of thanks that could have on uh, the community. So uh, one of the things that we started a few years ago uh, to, to just say, hey, thanks for your service to our country, as well as the service that you're providing to Booz Allen Hamilton for our veterans, as well as our military spouses, is uh, we send out in May and also in November uh, a card from our CEO, a word of thanks for, for the work that they do, and a little token like this uh, little lapel pen that most people will wear on their lanyards when they uh, come into the office. It, it shows that you're a Booz Allen veteran or a Booz Allen military spouse. And you'd be amazed at what a little device like this will actually do in terms of uh, <laughs> the, the morale and, and, uh, and, and that feeling of thanks you know, that, that you have there. I remember the, when we first did this, um, you know, it was all based on folks who had uh, self-identified either as a military spouse or as a veteran. 
And then we send out the, uh, the cards, personalized cards from our CEO to uh, the folks as, as well as the pens. And everybody started wearing them on their, you know, their lanyards. And uh, it had a, a beneficial effect as well because folks who did not receive them and were veterans, they saw it and they're like, hey, how, how do I get one of those? How'd you get one of these? So even though we had a very high number of folks that had self-identified, and this was not the, the goal behind it, but the number of military spouses and veterans that then turned around and self-identified to get one of these little lapel pins, uh, you know, shot up dramatically as well. It gave us a better feel for, you know, uh, the, the vets and the uh, military spouses that we have out there. So having a solid program that um, really helps with that growth and mentorship, especially of new, new newly hired uh, spouses and uh, veterans, and little things that you do along the way to show that token of appreciation can have a significant impact on the development and, and uh, retention. Awesome. So, hey, John Perez, I'm the head for military programs at Johnson & Johnson, and I'll, I'll answer this in three ways, and I'd love to pick up um, uh, where actually where you started with the things that you do for development and retention for veterans are likely the same that you're doing for the rest of your population. So I think it starts there. And so Johnson Johnson is the world's largest, most broadly based healthcare company. What we're doing for development and retention for someone who is a med tech field salesperson at a uh, you know at an entry level in Chicago should look different than what we're doing for a 30-year biochem PhD working in a research facility in Springhouse, Pennsylvania. Customizing development and retention by function, industry. Um, and geography, uh, really important, right? That's what all companies do. You think about you know, your different subgroups. Um, being great for development and retention more broadly for all your employees will cascade over and probably be the leading determinant of your veteran population. That brings me to my second thought though, is the veteran population and the military connected population looks different. And I think it goes into thinking about the subgroups within that. A member of this population is not the same as a transitioning JMO, my development and retention needs and the things that would need to be considered coming into a, a supply chain role, which is where I started, should look different than that um, non-degreed wage employee working at a manufacturing line uh, in, in Jacksonville, Florida. So thinking of the subgroups and what those, those needs are, whether it's by where they came in uh, to the company or by where they left from the military, right? Transitioning JMO versus, uh, you know, say junior enlisted non-degreed um, are they a current National Guard and reservist? Well, retention things like having a great military leave policy, so when they are activated, know that they're going to get the support of the company is really important. If they're a military spouse employee, being a member of MSEP, the Military Spouse Employment Partnership, and having programming and policies to ensure that as they transition to that next duty station in a PCS or during their, the, you know, the transition from terminal leave, that, that you're providing them the appropriate support is really important. So my sec that second broad point is think of the subgroups within the community and the tailor programming. And then the third one, I think we'll probably talk about this later. Uh, my third broad point would be hiring the right vets in the right role at the right level up front drives retention in particular, especially during that first, let's say, 12 months from whatever their transition is, whether they're directly coming from active duty or they're coming from uh, you know, that, that second transition after going to maybe a full time university. So you know, the, the right veteran, right, that they're a cultural fit into the organization, that they're coming in at the right level. So you don't have individuals saying, gosh, I had more professional responsibility seven years ago in the military than what I'm having now. I'm having to drop down three levels um, to go and, and just even make it into your company. They're hiring the right level, um, also incredibly important. And I think to accomplish that for us, it's a lot of let's let's do a lot of engagement before individuals uh, join the company. Let's make sure that in the recruitment process, they have that opportunity to go and engage with members of the veteran community in the role and in the field that they are targeting. So they could say, hey, I, this, this is brand new to me. I really don't understand this field. I understand the military, but I just don't understand what you guys do within J&J. &J. Can you sort of break it down to me in my own language? Give people that opportunity so that they can self-select upfront into, is this the right culture? Is this the right company for me? And then on the flip side for, for Johnson & Johnson, it's are we making sure that we're really hiring folks at the right level, right? So we're not saying, gosh, you got to take a three-level drop to come into the company, and then they get frustrated once they really understand what that means um, for, their, for their professional career. Thanks. Uh, Phil McConkey, president of Academy Securities. We're a disabled veteran investment bank. Uh, we come at it from a perspective a little different than the three gentlemen here with much larger organizations, uh, but I think it... Uh, 
is very appropriate when we look at uh, veteran hiring and retention. We started the firm about a dozen years ago. Two things were happening. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were winding down. There was a 37% unemployment rate for military veterans. At the same time, we're coming off uh, the Great Recession. So you had a lot of Wall Street professionals, veterans that were also uh, misplaced. So our idea was if we could bring that Wall Street veteran alongside a military veteran, right? We can create a first class financial services firm. You've got the Wall Street veteran with the know-how, the network, the ability to generate revenue. And then you've got the military veteran. What are military veterans all about? Honesty, integrity, loyalty, teamwork, something called service, right? We're in a service industry. And all too often in our industry, that part of it, your client's well-being is down at the bottom, right? Military folks know that that's the top and the very top. So when we bring in military veterans, especially back then, we would ask veterans, and, and this is appropriate also for corporations that we were serving, are serving. So for a military veteran that would come in to this day, we'd love to hire all of them, but we can't. We have a great network to help them find what's right for them and what's right for the company. But there's a couple things we would ask a veteran when they would come to us. One, are you a large company or a small company type individual, right? Are you more secure like you were in the Navy or the Marine Corps or the Army with this big organization like Johnson & Johnson, right? Are you more entrepreneurial in your spirit, a smaller company like us, you know, where do you fit? Because you don't want to bring in somebody to a small organization that's, you know, used to the big bureaucracy, no offense. <laughs> but but you want to make sure that they're comfortable so that they can succeed and thrive. So that's that's one part of it. So if they say a big company, well, we've got friends at JP Morgan and Johnson and Johnson and Comcast, we can direct you that way. So that's number one. Number two, are you an inside or an outside person? The veteran will look at us and go like, I I don't know. I was outside a lot. <laughs> I was in the field. I was, you know, a Navy diver. Or I was, you know, on a ship or whatever. Um, but inside person is more technical. They're compliance oriented. They're going through spreadsheets. Non-client facing, right? Outside people are client facing. What are you? What are you more comfortable with? So that's a question that veterans, transitioning veterans, need to be honest about with themselves, Right. We have a young lady who came to us about two years ago. She was an EOD officer in the Navy. For those of you that don't know, that means explosives ordnance disposal officer. So what does that mean? So part of her job as a Navy diver would be, you know, underwater diving, diffusing a bomb attached to a ship. I mean, right. So she comes to us and she effervescent young woman and I'm an outside person. I want to you know, I want to be in sales. Okay, we're going to put you in this, this chair here and this desk and, you know, we're a small company and we're going to have you pound the phones and make cold calls to people that don't know us or what we do. And you've got to introduce us and try to get in and we, you know, hopefully it can do some business at some point. And, you know, here's a Navy diver, an EOD officer. And, you know, she's sitting there looking at the phone the first day I remember and got her list. And, and if you know anything about sales, sometimes cold calling is pretty intimidating, right? And she was a little hesitant at first until one day I said, Kim, think about what you did in the Navy as a Navy diver, working with special forces, diffusing those bombs attached to the ship. All we're asking you to do is pick up a phone and say, hello, I'm Kim Bellis from Academy Securities. We'd like to introduce ourselves. You know, once she understood, right, the juxtaposition, she kind of laughed and realized, and now two years into it, I mean, flourished her career. What she's done for us, for our clients is absolutely amazing. This wonderful life that she's um, uh, finding for herself and her family. It's just absolutely incredible. Our clients adore her. Uh, and we've got you know, dozens and dozens of stories like that. So I think, you know, the big thing is, is for the veterans, big company, small company, inside, outside person. Excellent. That's great. Um, so, you know, we did a, uh, a pre-call where we all got together and uh, sort of talked about what we thought was most important to prepare for this panel. And uh, something that really stood out for me from that call was uh, just about all of you emphasized the importance of employee resource groups in uh, development and retention. 
Uh, so please, uh, each of you, let's just go in order again, start with that. Uh, talk about uh, how the role that plays, the role employee resource groups uh, play in uh, keeping and uh, elevating uh, military connected employees. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I guess I'm fortunate to go first again on this one because I, 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 from the call that we had, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, points that are going to be re-spoken on this, but yeah, definitely ERGs, our, our VetNet ERG is, you know, game changing. Um, I, I would say, you know, probably the biggest game changing point of, of our VetNet um, ERG is the fact that when we have new hires that come on board, it, it, it's, 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 it's a group that they can initially go to. They feel comfortable with that group. It's, it's a group of veterans. It's a group of people that are family members, veterans, champions of, of veterans in the military community, uh, military spouses, you know, er, you know, and it, it's a group they can go to and it's, it's something they know. It's something that they know they're leaving, you know, the military, especially the transition um, military people, you know, it's, it's, it feels like home for them. They go in, they have a comfort level. Um, you know, there's mentorship there that they can get, um, you know, to help guide them through this, this journey of, of coming to corporate America, coming to our, joining the Comcast team. And, you know, Comcast is a huge, we're a very inclusive company, um, you know, and we're very welcoming. And I'll tell you, so I transitioned straight out of the military to Comcast, right? Comcast is so welcoming and inclusive that it it, it kind of like I, I kind of got defensive a little bit at first. I was like, "Well, what is going on here?" You know, I came 23 years out of the army and, and right into this. Everybody's like, "Oh yeah, you can be with us, and you can be with us, and be on this team." And hey, what do you what do you think? What do you mean? What do I think? Uh, what, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. What? I don't understand this question. <laughs> what? I mean, so. I mean, the, so being part of the VetNet, you go and they have all done this already, right? Everybody in this group has already done this. They're, they're seasoned in the company. They're, they're, they walk the path you've walked and they can help. They basically grab your hand or, or you know, like, like John said earlier, you know, like give you a little leg squeeze in the dark and say, hey, you're okay, let's go. You know, and, it, and, it, and that's what it is and, it, and it's great. One of the things that we do with our VetNet also is, um, we do an ERG challenge grant, our team, right? So we provide resources to, to our vet net to do events throughout, throughout all the regions, to do an event, right? And the only, the only requirement of the event is they have to invite another ERG to do it with them, right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bridge that civ mill divide, right? We're trying to make the other ERGs, the other groups within Comcast understand we're not so different from them. We're actually part of every ERG the, the VetNet is actually part of every ERG that we have in Comcast, right? The only thing that the only thing different about VetNet, I, and we say this all the time in Comcast, is everybody in VetNet volunteered to be there, right? Every other ERG, you're basically born into it. You're born that way, like, or or you belong. There's some other tie you pretty much have that puts you with that ERG. VetNet, you volunteered. Everybody in that group volunteered at one point or another to to be that. So. Um, you know, so that's the only really difference we try to tell is from, and, and so we try to encourage, you know, do events with other ERGs. So you want, everybody understands like the, the, the other ERGs understand that, you know, we're not so different, the veteran community. And also it helps the veteran community within Comcast to understand, you know, the same thing, right? There's learning on both sides here and, and there's a lot of more understanding. And so that has actually trickled down to our hiring. I think that's actually one of the things that's helped us in hiring, you know, the trickle down effect on that is now there's more awareness because of the other ERGs and everything, you know, there's hiring managers in those ERGs. And so now they're getting the understanding of the military, the value we bring by doing events with them and being around them and understanding it better. And so there's, there's a trickle down effect there. But, you know, the, the big thing is, you know, there's a, there's a sense of belonging and a sense of being there and a, and a welcoming feel about, you know, participation. So similar at Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, you know, we have a, a military and veteran business resource groups. We have five business resource groups. That's, that's, that's one of them. And, you know, if you think about it, um, if you ask folks that have separated from the military, Hey, what do you miss most about, uh, the military? Most are going to reply the food, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> really good that's yeah. Coffee yes. and that. That uh, savory chicken and brown gravy that you got. <laughs> nah. 
the, the camaraderie, you know, right? So this is a uh, this is an opportunity for them uh, to to get together and be with you know some like-minded uh, folks. And I'd say there's like three significant drivers off the top of my head that that drive people into the the Milvet BRG. One, um, you know, if they're a veteran coming on board, they're going to get a welcome letter, and it's <laughs> it's highlighted all over the place. Hey, become a part of the the Milvet BRG. Here are some of the benefits of it. About a third of our employees, frankly, are, are uh, made up of veterans or military connected in one, one way or another. And, and so that, that camaraderie piece, they, uh, oftentimes they'll come along because of that. But because of the, uh, that transition center of excellence, the, the mentoring piece and so forth, that'll drive uh, some of the folks in. But you know, the other piece is that pay it forward kind of mentality as well. The individuals who've been with the firm for some time that want to be engaged with welcoming new uh, folks in, helping them acclimate, you know, to the uh, company as well. You have that uh, great mix of uh, individuals, and our BRGs do a wide variety of things. As I've highlighted, you know, they help with some of the mentoring and growth of our new employees. They're also heavily engaged in a lot of uh, community philanthropic type, you know, activities that that may have a focus on the uh, on the military side as well. So. This is just a great way to find out about those opportunities. And that seems to be a common thread with a lot of our folks, you know, giving back to the communities in which we work and live. And uh, this is a great resource for individuals to be able to do that. And sometimes, you know, you have individuals who come on board, maybe they were heavily engaged in something like that, even when they were on active duty. I know that uh, uh, I, was, I was pretty heavily involved in the Special Olympics um, just as a, uh, as, as, as a resource that, it, that attracted me to give. And when I came to, Booz Allen, you know, I, I saw that, hey, there's a right recruiting field to bring even more field people with me, you know, and being able to engage through our Milvet BRG was an excellent way to do just that. Yep. Very, very similar for Johnson Johnson. So we have 13 company-wide employee resource groups. Our veteran one has about 30 trap chapters spread across the U.S. with about 2,000 employees pretty actively engaged. And I say, you know, the value that it brings, the, the number one thing, it's about engaging employees. So if being a veteran or being a supporter or engaged with that community is really important um, to someone's self-identity uh, self identity or to the, the activities that they want to do as an individual, it's great that the company is able to say, great, you can, that part of you can be fully present here at work. And we can give you opportunities to go and engage if you want to do volunteer type activities. We can give you opportunities for the camaraderie, which is incredibly important. Um, we can give you opportunities for other professional development that's unique to the population. We give you great opportunities to go and engage, bring your, your, hey, you know, Johnson Johnson sells Band-Aids and consumer products, Neutrogena, Aveeno, Tylenol, things like that, right? The members of the military connected community are consumers of that. So to be able to even bring insights back to the actual business activities of, hey, I was a military spouse going and, and doing this. Here were my considerations as I was going through a military move, Neutrogena brand leaders, of, you know, brand leaders take these back as you're thinking about the sub demographics that you're you're selling your products to. Um, I'd highlight maybe two two other things. I think uh, the, the comments that were made are very uh, applicable to J and J, but I'll, I'll bring maybe two two additional things. One is, you know, I think it's very important for these employee resource groups to be very uh, to really demonstrate that they're open to all employees. I think pretty much every company would say you don't have to be a member of a demographic to become a member of this employee resource group. You don't want them to become overly closed uh, talking shops. I think that that ends up being can can create a toxic environment sometimes. Um, and then the you know, the, the the second really um, uh, broad point would be great for retention and development. Right again, if it's important to someone's identity to go and be engaged, um, perfect. There's now this opportunity. But I'll say there's this one the one percent case where individuals uh, take it too far. And you know these are typically meant to be volunteer activities. Sometimes they're in the goals and objectives, but it's usually a you know one to five, maybe a ten percent of someone's time. And you'll occasionally see folks who will, uh, you know, to borrow something from the university world, they'll they'll major in their minors. <laughs> they will spend too much time and they'll over-index and say, well, the company told me that it was really important to go and do these different employee resource group activities. And it's like, well, sure, but your number one responsibility was deliver this project, and you spent six hours last week on some of these other things that. If we had talked about it like we would any other projects, your management would have prioritized doing the thing that was the number one. So I'd say great for retention and development, but then there is that watch out of, hey, there's this 1% outlier, and there always is, right, that will, that will major in their minors. They'll spend too much time doing that, and they'll lose sight of the bigger picture for their career. 
Um, so that would be my one one sort of additional watch out besides the comments made here. Again, from the perspective of a smaller company, our program is much less formal. Um, I think the key for us is uh, lessons I've learned in my life is when you're on a team and you want to win, whether that's a sports team, you're on a military team or a corporate team, everyone on your team, everyone in your organization must be made to feel important. When everyone feels important on your team, you're going to get the best out of them. And it's going to help you win. Military veterans are the same. I was a pilot in the Navy, right? I flew helicopters. Yeah, I was the had my flight suit on, and yeah, I thought I was Tom Cruise. Well, I was before Tom Cruise, but <laughs> but the seaman apprentice or petty officer third class that was performing the maintenance on that aircraft was as or maybe more important than the pilot sitting in the cockpit. Because if he or she didn't do their job properly, crash, burn, and die. Just as well as the pilot not doing the job, right? I played pro football. I played in the NFL, just across the river with the Giants. I got here, I was 27 years old, 160 pounds. I hadn't played football in five years. And I'm trying to make the team as a punt returner, right? It's the lowliest job on a team as a punt returner, right? But the people that I worked with and played with, Hall of Fame linebackers, Harry Carson, Lawrence Taylor, coaches, Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, Tom Coughlin, those three guys won 10 Super Bowls, understood the importance of everyone being important. So that lowly job, you think, well, that defense just got off the field, right? They did their job. And that little you-know-what goes on the field and fumbles the ball away. They, I got to watch Harry Carson and Lawrence Taylor come back on the field after they just worked hard to get off. I'm going to do this job because they made me feel that that job was as important as theirs, as the quarterbacks. And when you're made to feel important, you get more out of yourself. You have more to give to your team. That's why those coaches have won all those Super Bowls. That's why we won a Super Bowl. That's why you're able to succeed in the military and perform incredibly dangerous missions day after day after day because everyone is made to feel important. So now you bring that person into a company and when they come in and if they're made to feel that way, I'm telling you, you get so much more out of them, especially if they're military veterans because they're used to it. They understand. So you want to win, make everybody on your team feel important. Hey, can I I'd just like to add uh, one, one little piece too. I just wanted to amplify on the point that was made here uh, on the, the BRGs. We, we have members on the Milvet BRG that are not veterans, and we call them champions of uh, veterans. Uh, and one of the things I just wanted to highlight, because you, you brought it up, sometimes I think they, they do it out of self-interest. But the neat story is the reason why they're on that is they hired a uh, transitioning military professional, or they have a veteran on their team that ends up being a rock star on their team. And their thought process is, well, how do I get more of these folks on my team? So they'll actually take advantage of these networks sometimes to uh, pull the internal moves in, but even learn a little bit more about, you know, hiring veterans and then taking advantage of that. So having it open to any and all is definitely a, a, a huge plus, And we definitely see that there. You know, and I think too, when you're developing and we're talking about retention and development, you know, part of that development is they develop these requisite skills that, you know, maybe surpass what we're even doing. And we've had a bunch of veterans that come in, knew nothing about financial services, knew nothing about the civilian world as far as business. And they developed these great skills and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan are luring them away from us. We don't want to lose them, but on one hand, but on the other hand, you're proud as like a child that, you know, goes off to, to college and goes off into the, their own bigger world. So, you know, that's part of the whole thing when you talk about development. Great, great stuff. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> so the next topic I want to touch on is mentorship. Um, can be uh, very uh, key, uh, crucial to uh, uh, having your employees feel connected to the company and uh, you know make it feel like a community. Uh, and let me start with Phil, so uh, you don't end up having to uh, get the last uh, <laughs> crack at every question. You know, I think you know part of our mantra is we hire train and mentor military veterans for careers in financial services. So the mentoring part is extremely important. Part of our success or a big reason for our success is we have paired those transitioning military veterans that come in 
first job out of the military that know nothing about financial services, know nothing about banking, know nothing about anything outside of the military, and you pair them with a Wall Street veteran that knows about all those things. So that mentorship is basically a, a one-on-one. -on -one. And then when you add on all the other facets and divisions of our business to help develop and train that, that veteran, that mentorship is all day, every day, uh, as they develop these requisite skills to add to not only us, but more importantly to our customers' success. So I think that mentorship is a huge part of what even a small company does on a daily basis. So mentorship when done well is great. When it is done poorly, it is a frustrating destroyer of value. What I think of mentorship and I think what Johnson Johnson does well with mentorship is focusing first, let's before we start in the veteran portion of it or the military connected population portion, it's thinking about the individual. What role are they in? What level are they at? What geography? You don't want to structure a mentorship program where the magic hat is deciding who you were paired with. Well, we threw 10,000 people's names into this database. We did a, a, a matching uh, Excel algorithm, and it just says, this person is your mentor. Well, I'm not in the same function. I'm not in the same business. I'm not in the same geography. I share zero connection with this individual. We'll talk on the phone twice because the company mandated that we were supposed to, but it was a waste of my time and her time to, to even be on the phone. That would be a bad program, right? A good program would really be one that is thinking about, well, gosh, hey, I'm, I'm going to be second ship supervisor at this manufacturing site. Let me go speak to, let me be matched up with someone who was doing that job two years ago, or is doing that job right now, but joined the company 12 months before or 36 months before, right? Where there's, you now have some common functional bond, you have a common level bond, um, geography, a, a, you know, common geographic bond, and maybe there's something else, right? Maybe you're both um, you know, Hispanic Americans, and you've made it a point to self-identify as Hispanic Americans. That's an important part of your, your identity and great. Our Hispanic uh, employee resource group can help do that. We would have mentorship programs through it. But again, the, the first lens being function, industry, that the core things that you're doing professionally as the first lens to really build a mentorship relationship. My second broad point and broad thought would be on the veteran population. Again, it's thinking of those sub-demographics within it. Um, right, so the individual who is that transitioning 06, who just finished command of a ship and now is coming over as a director within Johnson & Johnson, right, matching that person up and saying, well, we've got another veteran. Um, this person just transitioned. He's uh, going to be working third shift wage. He was uh, transitioned as a specialist from the Army uh, seven years ago. But you guys are both veterans, so hopefully this person can go and, and provide some mentorship to you. And no doubt there'll be some element there that that person will be able to support, right? Hey, I'm part of the company. Let me talk a little about the culture and our values and mission. But you, you, you're really much better off thinking of the sub-demographics within the population and trying to do things. And I think this goes back to employee resource groups and the value they can bring. So we have a new military spouse employee or a military spouse employee who's been at the company for a while but just hasn't had that mentorship and, and is trying to think about, gosh, how am I going to navigate this next PCS? I didn't have a good experience the first time. Great, our, our veteran, our military connected employee resource group has a military spouse network and we can match up the mentor leveraging that employee resource group to the appropriate individuals. We're really matching the sub demographic, which I think will make your military connected um, mentorship program that much more successful. So please Allen Hamilton, there are a number of uh, mentoring paths that individuals you know, have uh, exposure to. Uh, I'll just highlight a, a couple of them, or a few of them. Uh, the first is, of course, the formal one, and that is what I touched on earlier, that career manager that you are aligned to, he or she has that responsibility to mentor, nurture, help you grow your career. But then you have options that you can go out and choose as an employee of mentorship you know, type opportunities that are a little bit less uh, informal. So one common theme is through our MilVet BRG, where uh, you can get into that transition center of excellence and then it, you, you kind of roll into a mentorship program or you can seek it out. And what's really neat about um, that program is they have two options that you can move forward with. There's the one on one mentorship where you can develop that relationship. You find someone for whatever reason and you, you make that alignment and you get that one on one mentoring. But one of the other processes uh, that we have in place is called mentoring circles where it's a small group, six or seven individuals that get aligned to an individual and they meet on a recurring basis. 
that seems to become even more and more popular because in these group discussions, you may have someone who's a little quiet and reserved, but then the discussion gets going, you get a little synergy within the group. And next thing you know, you have an outstanding discussion on whatever the topic is uh, for that. So that's very popular as well. Then we have a resource uh, internally at Booz Island called Yammer. I don't know if you guys use that you know, as well, but it's, it's a place where a lot of more or less informal groups uh, more grow. And it's kind of like an internal Facebook page where we have one that's even pet oriented. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm totally obsessed with my dog, so I'm constantly going in there, you know, sharing pictures, you know, and so forth. But uh, there's a mentor group in there as well. And the neat thing about that is you can find a mentor that maybe isn't a veteran, but it's, it's in an area of growth that you want to focus on. And you can make those connections there. So it's a little bit informal, but the options out there for you to take advantage uh, of that. And, you know, it, it just helps, helps us overall. Yeah, Yammer's blown up at Comcast as well. It's, it's, it seems to be where everything's happening. I, obviously, the way I'm talking, I'm late to the party with the Yammer thing, so <laughs> I got to check it out. But yeah, at Comcast, same thing. Like, we have, oh my, I, I could even sit here and list all the mentorship paths you could take at Comcast. Um, so a little bit of our organizational structure. Our headquarters, obviously, is in Philadelphia. Um, but then we have three divisions that break down to 15 regions. And our 15 regions basically are pretty autonomous in the way that they, they run, right, um, under the, the way that, um, you know, our, our organizational structure is. So each region, and I say that because each region has their own mentorship programs in place. So I'll speak to the one that they do at headquarters uh, in, in Philadelphia, one of the, the, um, one of the official ones that they have. And through, that's the ERG mentorship program. So it's open to any member of any of the ERGs. Um, and... I like that program. Um, you're paired. It's about a nine month, nine or ten month program. Um, it's it's run annually. They bring in all men, new mentors, new mentees each year. I've done both. <laughs> I've been on both sides of it. I've been a, a mentee and a mentor through that program. Um, and I think the really neat thing about that one is, you know, it ramps up. So it starts off where you just start meeting with your mentor. You get to know each other. You you work. You know, you talk professionally about you know things that are going on in your professional world. And then, you know, how it relates and, you know, normal mentor to mentee type of conversations. Um, and then as the cohort progresses through the year, they put the mentees into teams, right, of, 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 of small group team, uh, teams. And then they give them some problems that actually the company is facing. They give them some actual problems that the company is, is facing. Um, and they ask them to, to work on it and provide a, a, a solutions. And then the capstone of, of, the, of the, mentor, the mentorship, the ERG mentorship each year, is the teams go and they present their solutions to a team of, I mean, it's all EVPs in this room. It's like, it's, it's the top people of Comcast that are sitting in this room listening to, and sometimes you have a tech ops person that's on one of these teams, right? Like they're, the, the, the fact that they're in the room with like Dave Watson is like a big deal to them. Um, and, and they're, they're providing a solution to an actual problem the company has. And there's one that's selected each year. And I've actually seen some of the, some of these things actually go forth and they tried to actually just put a business plan behind it and, and put them into, into, um, into, you know, action. So really the big takeaways through this mentorship program is there's huge networking opportunity. There's huge, huge growth opportunity. A lot of people. The, one of the side effect of the mentorship program is you see a lot of movement from the people that are mentees after their men, after the mentorship program because they're moving to other teams within the company, um, and it's usually based off of you know what they've learned through the capstone project. So, um, but it's huge successful program. Um, but yeah, that's just the one in headquarters. Like I said, each region has their own mentorship program, um, but yeah, it's totally very important. Yeah. Excellent. Great stuff. Um, so there's a point that uh, John mentioned a little earlier that I want to circle back on and uh, talk about a little more, and that is making sure when you are hiring veterans and members of the military connected community, you are hiring them at a level commensurate with their experience. Uh, and I'll start with John. Uh, you know, Talk about the importance of that, please. Yeah. Listen, I think if you are... I you never want to have the situation where you have somebody who's coming in and saying, hey, I'm a 31-year-old I'm a senior manager, and I had more professional responsibility when I was a 21-year-old junior Army officer or junior Navy officer leading soldiers or sailors in Iraq or Afghanistan. Right? That's not good for the individual. It means they probably have not professionally progressed as a result of the organization they're working. 
And it means that the organization is not getting everything out of that individual that could be getting, right? So you're leaving value on the table. It's frustrating. Um, so for Johnson & Johnson, you know, one thing that we did starting uh, in 2017, we created a leadership development program. Uh, we actually now have two tracks of it. So one where we bring folks in as managers, another one where we bring folks in at our, at our director level. And they're really designed for those transitioning service members who say, you know, I'm not 100% sure what function I necessarily want to go in. I know I want to be a leader in the healthcare industry. Um, I know I've got great skills and competencies and experiences coming from the military. I, I know I can be successful in your organization. But if, if you ask me right now, the only thing that I want to go do is be a marketer or I want to go be a supply chain leader. I'm not 100% sure because I did a whole bunch of things while I was in service. So these programs help bring folks in at that appropriate level but lets them have that breadth of functional experience. Uh, in, in the case of these two programs, one is three six-month rotations. The other one is two nine-month rotations at our director level. But it's giving them some exposure, and they would never really you know, probably be super competitive for roles at those levels. Why? Because large companies tend to hire in functional and industry silos. right? So right off the bat, they're all switching industries. Hard to be a, a, even one switcher, but and often you know they're they're switching uh, the function. So I use my own example, right? I was a Signal Corps officer in the Army, and then I've spent most of my time within supply chain and in some other work related to, um, to acquisitions and divestitures before the role I'm in right now. I did not do any work related to supply chain while, while I was an Army officer. I certainly didn't do any work related to acquisition and divestiture. So you know to come in and say, oh, gosh, this is the only thing I want to go do. Um, I would be competing against folks who've been doing that exact work at Merck, at Pfizer, at BMS, at Stryker, at Medtronic. You know, for a hiring manager, I'd say, well, gosh, I'm not going to take the chance to go and hire you at this level. I you know, come in, start, learn something new. Um, you know, these programs give that opportunity to go and explore different things, um, and then come in at that that other level. The second thing that the program does for us is it, it helps change some of that mindset that, that, hey, I've got this risk I don't want to take of taking someone who's an industry or functional switcher. Well, gosh, I could take this person coming in through this leadership development program, kind of throw them in at no risk to me as a hiring manager. And then I could see that, that learning agility that everybody talks about for the military population is a real true thing. And they're coming in with all sorts of different skills and insights. And you know what? Actually, the next time I do have that direct opening for a, for a director band position, you know, actually, I will take you know, look at that transitioning, um, you know, master sergeant, I will take a look at that transitioning lieutenant colonel coming out, which probably has about the same number of professional years of experience that we would hire at that director level. Um, you know, the, that, that first 12 months retention, uh, for the you know, first 12 months post-transition retention issue that people within this, this space often talk about, you know, it, it, there's a, a handful of reasons for it, right? One is, hey, people are sort of taking the first job that comes up and uh, you know, maybe it's not the right company culture, maybe it's not the right industry, but but another major driver of that is, gosh, I, I took something that wasn't appropriate for me by level, um, and no company really wants that. So I think for us that these leadership development programs were one kind of innovative way to go and you know, approach it, but I think we'll probably talk about some other great ways to go and think about hiring at the right level. Edward, George, Phil, anything like that? I'm just going to say, um, you know, to John's point, it, it's... it's Really, you know, he's absolutely correct. It's it's totally important, um, and and I just want to highlight the importance of like a, the in the value of events like this one, because I've heard John talk about that previously, and we actually have had a call with him and his team to learn about his um, you know uh, leadership development program because we want to we we want to set something similar up ourselves at Comcast, and so by being connected through you know groups like this one and being in the same space. You know, I reached out to him and just said, hey, can we hop on a call and pick your brain on what you're doing? And he was very welcoming and, and gave us a lot of great points and basically gave us the path to set our own up. So I want to, you know, thank you for that. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely important. And I echo everything he just said. So. And one of the things that uh, we do at Booz Allen is, um, you know, around the hiring piece at the right level, I mean, we've got 2,000 plus jobs posted out there, you know, right now in Oakley. So there's a wide variety of roles. But sometimes it can definitely be a little confusing to try to determine if you're coming out of the military as a uh, as a sergeant or a lieutenant colonel. Hey, which which role is appropriate? Uh, which one's at the right level? So one of the things that we did uh, a few years back was we developed a military recruiting team, and their focus is to put the human element back in the hiring process. So like many companies out there, we're going to drive all our applicants <coughs> to the career page and tell you this is where you need to apply. This is your first official step. 
But what our military recruiting de team does is, again, they put that human element back in the hiring process. They don't own any requisitions. Their focus is to develop a pipeline of talent and then, and then help push the individuals to the right opportunity. So they do a lot of coaching and mentoring just on the hiring process and helping uh, individuals identify the appropriate role to move forward and apply to. Uh, they give feedback uh, to individuals when they apply. What's one of the most discouraging things as an applicant when you're looking for a job uh, that, that occurs in that process? You go to a uh, you go to a great event, you meet some outstanding people that tell you about the uh, wonderful things in their companies. They tell you to the go go to the career page and apply. You apply to six different opportunities, and uh, you feel like those applications all went to a black hole. Our military recruiting team works with those individuals to give them real-time feedback. Most of the time when individuals do apply to a role in our organization where they meet all those qualifications, it's simply because the timing's off. You know, that job might be open, but we're already in the offer stage with someone, something like that. But just being able to provide that feedback to individuals is helpful, but also having that human being there telling an individual, hey, uh, you know, with your 20 years experience that you have doing A, B, and C, here are a handful of roles that actually make sense for you to move forward with. If you apply, let me know, then I'm gonna work with you and push that application through to at least get you to the screen in the interview process. You know, I think too, it's important to realize that, you know, you can't hire all the veterans and you've got great programs to hire and develop and retain military veterans, but sometimes you can engage another entity, a smaller company like ours, um, and we do that same job and we hire and train and mentor these kids. And a great example is Comcast. They've engaged us for a number of years. They're a big part of the success that we've had as a growing entity and uh, uh, allowing us to hire and train and mentor uh, even more veterans. So it's indirectly, you're indirectly responsible for our success in the hiring and training and changing the lives of, of, of many military veterans. So uh, in your organization, again, if you're uh, looking to engage outside services, you know, I encourage you to first look at uh, veteran owned and operated entities uh, to do that type of work first. Great stuff. Uh, so we have a little more than 10 minutes left uh, in this panel and uh, wanna make sure uh, we uh, give you all the opportunity to uh, ask questions. So uh, please, uh, if you've got a question for our panel, uh, raise your hand and we will come around with a mic momentarily. All right. Well, thank you guys. This is an ab absolutely outstanding conference and, and so great to be back in person. My name is, is Lance Widener and I am the head of veteran programs for the Training and Consulting Consortium. And the, uh, the founder, Mr. Bob Bazork and I have been working for a couple of years. We, we go into companies to actually build training programs uh, to, to, to help with some of these, these attrition issues. I think maybe George, you, you had mentioned it. I, I wanna juxtapose a couple of remarks. One that John said, which is point number three, which is that veterans, they, they have that metal that, that they just don't say no, right? And, and at the same time, we're finding that as we go into these companies, um, actually somewhere around that 12 to, to 24 month mark, there's, there's a, I think a surprising amount of attrition in, in these companies. The question is, is, is if there is that dichotomy and, and probably recognizing that your four companies are, are more the exception than the rule, we are always surprised at, at these major companies that have tremendous backing, tremendous financial resources, and they still have trouble retaining veterans. What do you think is, what is that cause? What's, what, are, what are the underlying factors? So um, I would say that uh, one of the leading factors, especially when it comes to that recently separating veteran, their first job out of the military, right? It's a totally different environment when you're making a transition from the military and you're looking for a new career than when you're maybe in a career and you're thinking about making a career move. When you're in the military, the clock's running. Maybe you have a family to support and uh, you're planning your transition well in advance. And sometimes it's the fault of companies like ours, but when do companies engage you for the interview process? Most of the time, when you're in that 90-day window of availability, maybe even the 60-day window of availability, and at that point, you're almost at a high stress panic stage. And that first offer that comes along, you're on it. You don't have time to do the due diligence, find the right opportunity. It's the right environment. It's the right fit. And then six months into it, you realize that uh, because you 
your back was against the wall, the clock was running, you, you made a poor choice. There, there are definitely some, uh, some great resources in play right now that help with that skill bridge being one of them. Uh, but for the most part, I think that's the biggest driver, right? Your back's against the wall, the clock's running, you're running out of time, and then you finally get traction and you jump on an opportunity. Yeah, I 100% agree with, with George. Um, you know, think about it. Put, most people don't go into the military with a family. Most people leave the military with a family, right? So in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, this is the first time they're looking for a job with, with actual responsibilities, with life responsibilities on their you know, I'll use myself as an example. You know, I graduated high school. I went in the army the next week. Like literally, the next week I was in the army, and then I didn't have to look for a job again because I kept reenlisting because looking for a job was just too much work. <laughs> and so I just said I'll just stay in until they don't want me anymore. And then 23 years, I have you know, wife, kids, dogs, bills, and I didn't have all that when I went in. So, yeah, to your point, you know, not saying I didn't, I made a bad choice because I mean. It, for me, it worked out, um, but you know, the first offer that came, there was really no thought about it. It was like, okay, I, now I know I can separate from the military, I'm gonna have an income coming in, and I'll figure it out when I get there, right? I was a medic in the Army, I was a recruiter in the Army, and I took a job as a project manager, right? How many official project manager jobs had I held up to that point? Really, zero, that's how many. Now I ran like probably hundreds, maybe a thousand projects in my time in the military, but I didn't know what I was doing, right? I, I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know, you know, I didn't have all the little fancy terms for it. I didn't have the PMP. I didn't have all that, all that stuff. Um, so, you know, it, for me, it was kind of like, I'm going to get out. I'll figure it out. I always do. Um, and then, you know, for me, it, it worked out. I picked a field that I actually love. And I, I, I love doing it, and it, it, it fell right into kind of my wheelhouse. Um, but I think other people, it, that doesn't always work that way, right? So they're getting out, they're getting this job, they're feeling like, okay, now I can separate and make this transition over. And they're getting there, and they're A, they're realizing either they're overqualified or they're underqualified. And I'm probably thinking there's probably more that are overqualified than under, right? And so they're getting out there, and it comes to the second thing, they're, they're getting out there, and they're like, they didn't know how to value themselves as they left the military, right? And so now they're getting out there and they're like, oh my God, I am like so underpaid. It's ridiculous. I, I took what? And I have this much value with, with what I bring to the table. And, you know, I love the U.S. Army and I will always love the U.S. Army, but the U.S. Army does a, did a terrible job of making me understand my value outside of the U.S. Army. I know what my value is in the U.S. Army. I could tell you, they, you know, in my sleep what it is. I know what it is, you know, but outside of the Army, I, I had no clue, zero. And, I mean, Skillbridge, absolutely fantastic program. It is, it, I wish Skillbridge was there when I got out. I tell people all the time when I talk to the Skillbridge people, I'm like, the, the ones that are, the fellows that are going through now or people that are in Skillbridge, and I'm like, you know, I wish this was here. I would have used this myself because it's a game changer. And so... Um, but I think it's those two things. I think it's just you, you don't know what your value is. And, and then when you get out, you know, you're, you're just taking, like George said, you're taking the first thing coming because the most important thing is providing for your family, right? You, you, you don't even consider the rest of the stuff at that point, I don't think. And the separating veteran. Now, the one that's been out for a while, that's a whole different story. I, I, I don't even know where to begin on that one, so... And I'll, maybe I'll just really quickly kind of summarize a little bit uh, my takeaway for this. It's an attraction and a recruitment problem, not a retention problem, because you've probably brought in the wrong individuals to begin with, right? They're individuals who, and, and to that point, if I didn't know my value, great, it's incumbent upon the employer to explain to that person what the value is. You need to provide all of the information up front before they sign, I'm joining your company, so that they can make a fully informed decision. And I always talk, when I talk to transitioning uh, service members or members of the military connected community considering J&J, &J, I, I always say success for this in the recruitment process for J&J &J is not, did we convert you? Great, we made, you know, you kind of went through the process, we made an offer, we've now converted you, joined the company. Great, success. No, I tell them success is, did you have significant information? Did you have enough information to make an informed decision that you feel good about? That's success. So if the answer is, you know what, I went through this process, I had six interviews, looks great, seemed, seems like a good team, but you know what, 
culturally not for me. I want to be at the small company. Good, that's fine. You, you made a fully informed decision for you and your family. That even extends to total compensation and how they're going to, right, their, their total value. They need to have all that up front. So I think it's more an attraction or recruitment problem as opposed to, you know, subsequent programming. Now, I do think there's sub demographics within the population that you could look to and say, well, gosh, maybe we need to change our programming. National Guard and Reserve, again, I think another great example of it. If you have somebody who's left active duty, okay, now I'm going to do some National Guard time. They come to the company and, you know, it turns out that that manager they're directly reporting to, I'm sure, they follow you, Sarah. They don't punish the individual. They follow the step up principle. Maybe the company even provides some pay differential. But you know what? That manager doesn't understand what they're doing. Says like, "Oh, what do you mean you went and did five months as a company commander somewhere? I, I, I don't care. Like you, you know, you're not managing any employees on this team over here. You need some people leadership experience before I want to promote you." Okay, that's a different one. Then there's some training and programming. You could do cultural competence training for that manager. You could say, "You know what? We maybe need to switch from pay differential to full pay on top of." But I, then that would be a sub demographic by sub demographic you know, consideration, military spouses being another one. But I think it's really an attraction and retention problem more than it is a programming one. Fantastic. Uh, next question. Hey, thank you guys for hosting this. My name is Matthew Mickey, and, you know, this is a phenomenal event. So I'm with Dialect, and all dial Dialect, for you guys who don't know, is a veteran-based company, and all we do is we take natural language processing and we – conversation and we, you know, design a software using your company's database, right? And so basically just thank Google, right? We take your data, whatever data you have, you ask it questions within the data and then it'll spit out the results within seconds, right? And you know, so Dialect was designed by a veteran. A good friend of mine was paralyzed through service and he was in the hospital room, you know, and he Googled financial data for the stock market that day and nothing came up. So he came to us and was like, this is really frustrating. Like I had to go to a thousand different websites, blah, blah, blah. And we built this business. Right. And now Jonathan earlier in the conversation, he did an amazing job and you guys are doing an amazing, amazing job describing, you know, the important attributes developed in the military from for veterans. Right. And that's highly appreciative as, I currently am retiring this year after joining the Army the day after 9-11. You know, like, my value, it took a lot. I dropped 136 resumes. They hear back from zero companies, right? Um, and then I thought, you know, what is my value? Like, so, like, him being able to, like, so well describe, you know, the level of understanding variable analysis, you know, asset synchronization and capability employments along with rehearsals that a military person has after hitting the village at two o'clock in the morning, you know, after a 12 mile infill, like the importance of that and how it transitions into the, into the companies for veterans, like that's outstanding. So I applaud you on that. So my question would be, you know, like, what do you guys suggest or recommend for veteran built companies? For example, like in Dialect, we have six employees and like we, me being an initial partner, I am the lead educator, as you can see the advertiser. I, de I developed the, the language design based off that company. Like, and like we are having a tough time, you know, managing the company because we're all veterans and we don't have business degrees. I have my master's in public admin and statistics and the other guys have it in other things. So we lack that, that growth that comes with bigger companies. Is there an organization out there that, you know, will sync with veteran organizations and kind of mentor them as they manage companies? Thank you. So this is a good plug for Misty Fox, Misty, wave to the crowd. You're going to have the opportunity with Misty shortly, who's the director of entrepreneurship at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, a remarkable person, a friend. You're going to have you're, you're in for a treat very shortly. That I think that is the, the most appropriate person. I'm, I'm staring right at her. So I think that's that's the right answer for leadership on, uh, you know, how to how to grow veteran owned businesses, military spouse owned businesses. I think there's probably no. There's a number of different support organizations, but I see, uh, I saw Misty there and wanted to do a quick plug. And uh, yeah, so I think that, I don't know if everybody else has other thoughts, but. It's yeah. funny you say that because I was thinking the same thing. And then uh, <laughs> there's uh, Bunker Labs too, oh, you yeah, may want to uh, look into as well. 
Yeah, I, I, I just think something that I touched on earlier, our success is based on the fact that we have military veterans and Wall Street veterans. So to have a non-veteran professional potentially to come in or a couple of them to help um, you know, bridge that gap could be extremely beneficial to what you're doing. All right. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. I wish we had time to get to more questions, but uh, everyone, please give this panel a round of applause. What a great job.